Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming tonight, for joining us tonight on Zoom. My name is Christine Muir. I am the community librarian at Cary Library. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, while people were still coming in, uh, there will be an opportunity for questions at the end of the presentation. You can use the chat feature to enter a question, or you can, when we're ready, um, you can unmute yourself or raise your hand and I will call on people individually so that we don't speak over each other. Um, it is a very interactive presentation tonight, which I'm excited about. I think it will be the most interactive one that I've been in so far. So um, I am recording the event and it will be posted on our YouTube channel for people who aren't able to attend. You do have the option to turn off your camera if you do not wanna be recorded. I will be spotlighting my camera and Andrew's camera um, and he'll be presenting some slides, but there will be times when he wants to engage with the audience and so we may move into gallery view. If you do not wanna be caught on camera, you can turn yours off. You can still participate um, using the reactions button in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. It may be at the top of the screen if you're on a tablet. Um, and again, you can use the chat at any point to enter questions or comments or um, to react to something that's been said or asked. So I'm excited to see how this goes with all of this engagement. Um, so tonight, I would like to welcome Dr. Andrew E. Budson. He is um, the Chief of Cognitive and Behavioral Neurology and Associate Chief of Staff for Education at the Veterans Affairs Boston Healthcare System. He's the Director of Education at the BU Alzheimer's Disease Center, a Professor of Neurology at BU School of Medicine, a Lecturer in Neurology at Harvard Medical School, and the author of five books on Alzheimer's um, as a condition. Tonight, he's here to talk about his book, Seven Steps to Managing Your Memory, What's Normal, What's Not, and What to Do About It. And we will have some links to the, uh, to the book in the chat and in a follow-up email that you'll all get tomorrow with a link to the recording and um, a survey asking you what you thought about tonight's program and what else you'd like to see us offer at the library. So again, welcome to all of you. Thank you so much to Andrew for being here tonight. And I will turn things over to him now. Okay, is the technology working? Can you all hear me? Yes? Looks good. All right, very good. So this is, I think, gonna be a fun program tonight. We'll be doing a little slideshow. I'll be getting your views on all sorts of things. I'll be having you give me a thumbs up or sometimes raising your hand. And if you are uh, not uh, showing your video, that's no problems. Again, you can use those reaction buttons either on the top or the bottom to make that little thumbs up uh, appear in the corner of your screen if you want to participate in that way. So let's get going. So here is my first slide, it just uh, gives the same titles uh, that you heard about uh, a minute ago. And we are going to be talking about the seven steps to managing your memory. But I did wanna say that my only disclosure is that I do generate revenue. Uh, if you buy a copy of this book, I get 70 cents for every copy. So you see, this is why you know, academics, publishers make a lot of money. But in all seriousness, uh, you don't need to buy the book to read it because it is at the Lexington Library. So I, I do encourage you, support your library, check the book out there. But of course, you know, if you wanna get a copy of your very own, you can do it. You can get it in e-form, you can get it in audible form uh, as well. So this is the book here that we're going to be uh, talking about. And we're going to talk about all these different uh, steps to managing your memory. But I'm going to begin by uh, going through some of the questions that we have in the preface to get your views on some common memory problems. Now, as I read through 
each of these common memory problems. I want you to give me a thumbs up if you think to yourself, well, that's just fine. This is what happens in normal aging. There's no problem with that. Thumbs up, not a problem. If, on the other hand, as I read through a scenario, if you say, wait a minute, that could be the start of Alzheimer's disease or dementia, give me a thumbs down or just don't give me a thumbs up to say, you know, you might be concerned about that. All right. So here is the first uh, scenario. And I am going to pin my uh, video. There we go. So here's the first scenario. So you walk into a room to get something and you forget why you're there. So what do you think? Is that normal thumbs up or not normal? Problem, thumbs down. All right, I see a lot of thumbs up. I wanna see a thumbs up from everyone. That one is normal. Ooh, thank God, right? If that one wasn't normal, we'd all be in trouble, right? Okay, here's the next one. You're having trouble remembering some of the details of your life, such as your wedding. What do you think? Normal thumbs up or not normal? Thumbs down. All right, I'm seeing a lot of thumbs down there. A few people say, no, that one's okay. Uh, there almost seems to be a gender split on this one. The men are like, that's fine. The women are like, what are you talking about? That's not fine. All right, how about this one here? When you are driving and not paying attention, you take one or more wrong turns and you end up somewhere you did not intend to be. What do you think? Normal or not normal? Hmm, I'm seeing sort of a split decision on that one. A lot of people thumbs down, some people thumbs up. All right, let's try this one here. You have difficulty finding your car in a parking lot. What do you think? Normal, thumbs up? Abnormal, thumbs down. Hmm, people aren't quite sure. Most people are like, I hope that one's normal, right? Okay, and how about my all time favorite? Your family tells you that you've asked that question before. What do you think? Normal, not normal? Hmm, oh, I see some split decisions. Some people think yes, some people say no. So it is my goal this evening to empower you with the knowledge so that you will be able to know whether these and other common memory problems that you may be experiencing or you may see in a loved one, whether these things are normal, whether they're not, and most importantly, what to do about them. But before we dive into the seven steps, I want to introduce you to two characters that we have written into the book. <clears throat> now, we wrote the characters into the book to both make the book a little bit more engaging, as well as to illustrate the seven steps to managing your memory. I did wanna let you know that if you wanna read the book, but you're like, I don't wanna read all the stories, you can skip the stories, they are optional. But during a little book talk like this, when I do, uh, read from the book, it will be from the stories because it's a little bit more fun. So here is the first story. This is about Sue. That could have been embarrassing. Sue thinks to herself, she was halfway through lunch with one of her closest friends before the name of her friend's husband came to her. How could I have forgotten? She thinks again. She could remember everything about him except his name. Now Sue was able to cover for this little memory lapse. In fact, she has become quite good at covering for lapses such as these and laughing it off when the lapse was noticed. Sue herself, however, isn't laughing. Sue is worried about her memory. Worried, in fact, is a bit of an understatement. She is absolutely terrified that she is developing Alzheimer's disease. Now, Sue has not mentioned her concerns to her friends or her children. Her children would only worry and overreact and she doesn't need that. 
Her friends wouldn't be interested in hearing about her concerns either. It would only make them anxious about their own similar memory difficulties. Or worse, they would start to treat her like an invalid and stop including her in their social activities. Sue thinks about some of her other memory lapses. Just yesterday, she walked downstairs to the basement and could not remember for the life of her what she was going down to get. It was only when she walked back to the kitchen that she remembered the roll of paper towels that she needed, which she then successfully retrieved. She doesn't have difficulty remembering what happened yesterday or the week before, but she finds it quite difficult to remember things from her childhood. Is that normal? Sue isn't sure. So that's a little bit about Sue. Now I'm going to introduce you to another character whose name is Jack. Now Jack has just come from his local community lodge where Sam, one of his buddies, said, Jack, you should get your memory checked out. I'm worried you could be developing Alzheimer's disease or dementia. Could he be right? Jack thinks about Sam's words. He's not sure whether he should thank Sam or slug him. Part of him wants to do both. Deep down, he knows that Sam is trying to be helpful, but he has a lot of nerve. Sure, Jack knows he has some memory problems, but who his age doesn't? Just because Sam's wife has dementia, all of a sudden he thinks he's a goddamn doctor. Not that the doctors know very much about memory problems from what Jack could tell. Sam had to take Mary to her doctor four times before the doctor actually did anything about it. Jack considers this memory. He didn't think anything is wrong, at least not any more than with anyone else his age. He is 72 after all, at least Half his friends have similar difficulties remembering what they did yesterday or were going to be doing the following day. The more Jack thinks about it, the more he thinks his memory probably is normal, better than normal in fact. How many people his age can list off their buddies from high school and the make, model, and year of the cars that they drove? Still, Jack feels unsettled. Sam stressed that the reason he was bringing it up is there were medications that Jack could take that could improve his memory. He doesn't want to be stupid. After all, he has never been one to run away from a problem. He'd rather stand and confront it. Perhaps he should call his doctor. Okay, so that is a little bit about the uh, characters that we've written into the book. And we are now going to dive into the seven steps to managing your memory. And we're going to begin with step one, which is learn what is normal uh, memory. And I am going to begin with a filing system analogy as to how your memory works. So let's say there's some information that you want to remember. Well, the first part of the filing system that you need is your file clerk. Your file clerk is actually a part of your brain. It's your frontal lobes right behind your forehead. And it's the frontal lobe file clerk's job to take that information in from the outside world and then to put it into the physical file cabinet. Well, that's good, but guess what? As we all get older, our frontal lobe file clerk gets older too. And I'm going to give you an analogy of the three things that happen to our older frontal lobe file clerk. So, the first thing that happens is she does not hear quite as well as she used to. What? And because of that, information may need to be repeated a couple of times in order to get a hold of the information. 
and to put it into the file cabinet. Another thing that can happen to our older frontal lobe file clerk is she does not move as quickly as she used to. And because of that, if she is digging around in the file cabinet, uh, trying to get the information, it may take a little bit of time for her to walk over to the file cabinet to get that piece of information. Another thing that happens to our older file clerk is she does not see quite as well as she used to. So you can imagine that when she is looking for the information that she needs up and down that file cabinet, she may need a hint or a cue in order to get the information that she's looking for. But importantly, as long as the information got into the file cabinet, it should be able to be retrieved, even if it takes a little bit of time or a hint or a cue. So in a nutshell, those are the problems that occur as part of normal aging. So now we're going to turn to step two, which is determine if your memory is normal. And we are going to talk about some of the changes that occur in Alzheimer's disease. And we're gonna continue with our analogy of the file system, but now we're gonna focus on the file cabinet itself. The file cabinet is another part of your brain. It's called your hippocampus, which is deep in your temporal lobes. And they're right by your temples of your head. So if you put your fingers on your temples, they're just deep in there. Now, the problem in Alzheimer's is Alzheimer's damages and ultimately destroys the hippocampus. And the way I think about it, it's as if there's a big hole in the bottom of the file cabinet. Well, if there's a hole in the file cabinet, you can have the best, most efficient file clerk in the world, pulling the information in from the outside world, putting it into the file cabinet. But what's gonna happen? It's gonna disappear into the hole, never to be retrieved again. And when that happens, even when information is repeated, even if you wait a bit of time or you give a hint or a cue, you won't be able to retrieve it. And when that happens, we call it rapid forgetting. Because even though the information was learned, it's rapidly forgotten and cannot be retrieved. So now we're going to catch up with Sue to learn about some of the other problems that occur in Alzheimer's disease. Now, Sue is having a cup of coffee with Sam. You may recall that Sam's wife, Mary, who is a friend of Sue's, has Alzheimer's. So Sue is talking with Sam to learn a little bit more about the disease. How did it start with Mary? Sam looks closely at Sue, seeing the worry in her eyes. Well, everybody's different, but I think with Mary, it began when she got lost while she was driving. Mind you, I didn't know what was going on at first. I just knew it would take her a long time to go from one place to another. Looking back, I also began to realize that she was traveling to fewer places. It was as if the circle of where she would go was getting smaller and smaller and smaller. First, she didn't drive in the city. Then she didn't drive on the highway. Then she didn't go anywhere new. I mean, I didn't think it was a big deal at first. I mean, who really wants to fight the traffic in the city or on the highways anyways? But the red flag to me was when I got a call from the doctor's office at two o'clock in the afternoon saying she had not shown up for her one o'clock appointment. 
So now I'm starting to get worried. Did she have an accident? Was she okay? A few minutes later, she comes through the door in tears, telling me she could not find the doctor's office. That was the thing that really made me realize that something was wrong. So let's talk about getting lost for a minute. Anybody of any age can get lost. You make a wrong turn, something doesn't look familiar, bam, you're lost. But what do we all normally do? Well, you can pull out a map from your glove compartment or this day and age, probably more likely from your phone. You can use your GPS device or you can pull over and ask for directions. And using any of those methods, you're back on your way. But with Alzheimer's, paper maps and phone apps and GPS devices can be complicated and confusing to use. You can pull over and ask for directions, but they're often long and detailed and hard to remember. And for those reasons, getting lost is a problem in Alzheimer's. Let's talk about another uh, common problem in Alzheimer's, which is losing things, misplacing things. But guess what? Misplacing things is also pretty common for anybody of any age. I want you to either raise your hand or use the reactions and give me a thumbs up. If over the last year, you have misplaced your keys, glasses, wallet, pocketbook, has that happened to anybody? Yeah, guess what? Me too. So if you're losing things or misplacing things, how do you know? How do you know if it's a problem or not? Well, if you are someone who every morning, all your life, you spend five, 10, 15 minutes, you know, hunting around the house, you know, trying to find, you know, where you left something. And now you're getting a little bit older and you're still spending five, 10, 15 minutes uh, running around the house uh, looking for things. Well, guess what? That's probably normal for you and not something to worry about. But if you were something who was always very organized, never had difficulty with uh, being able to uh, find things, and now you're spending five, 10, uh, 15 minutes uh, running around the house uh, looking for things, maybe you're taking an hour, maybe you had to buy a new cell phone because it never did turn up, maybe you had to cancel the credit cards because you never could find that wallet, well, that could be a problem. So the point I'm trying to make here is it's not only what the problem is, but it's also whether it represents a change from the way things used to be. Now, the last thing I wanna talk about in this section is about repeating questions and stories. Now, anybody, can be halfway through telling a story to a good friend and you say, oh my God, I told you this already, didn't I? And anybody can forget the answer to a question and ask it again. But when there is a pattern of repeatedly asking the same question to the same person again and again and again, or telling the same story to the same people over and over and over again, that is not normal. That is usually related to that rapid forgetting that we were talking about. And as I mentioned, rapid forgetting is never normal. It should always be evaluated. Okay, so that is a little bit about step two, which is <clears throat> um, determining if your memory is normal. Now we're going to move over to step three, understand your memory loss. And I'm going to ask you uh, about some of the most common questions that I get asked, which is what's the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's disease? And I would like you to give me either a raised hand or a thumbs up if you are familiar with the term dementia. People familiar with the term dementia? Yeah, okay, good, I think lots of thumbs up. Now, 
Same thing, give me a raised hand or a thumbs up if you are familiar with the term Alzheimer's disease. Okay, and people are familiar with that one too. Now, how about this? Give me a raised hand or a thumbs up if you have a very clear understanding as to the distinction between dementia and Alzheimer's. So that one's a little trickier. A few people are like, yeah, I sort of know what the difference is. So let me spend, uh, let me spend a minute uh, going through it here. So dementia is a general term that means thinking and memory have declined to the point that it interferes with day-to-day -day function. So that's what the word dementia means. And as a general term, I think about the word dementia, like I think about another general term, which is headache. Now, a headache can be from a lot of different things. You can have a muscle tension headache or a migraine headache, neither of which are very serious. But you can also have a headache from a stroke or a brain tumor, both of which are serious. And with dementia, it's the same way. You can actually have dementia from a vitamin deficiency or a thyroid disorder, both of which are totally curable. But you can also have dementia from a variety of different brain diseases, including Alzheimer's disease, frontotemporal dementia, dementia with Lewy bodies, vascular dementia, which is dementia due to stroke, and there are many other types as well. So dementia is the general category and Alzheimer's is one type or one cause of dementia. Got it? Okay, let's talk about another common uh, term in this field, which is mild cognitive impairment. Raise your hand or give me a thumbs up if you're familiar with the term mild cognitive impairment. Have people heard of that? Yeah, most people have heard of that one too. So let's talk about uh, that one for uh, uh, a minute. So mild cognitive impairment is present when there's three things. The first is that someone is concerned about the memory. The second is that the testing confirms this concern. And the concern can be raised by the person themselves, can be raised by their family, or it can be raised by their doctor. But the third thing is that the individual's day-to-day -day function is fine. And as we mentioned, if one's day-to-day -day function is fine, then by definition, they do not have dementia. Now, what the studies show is if you follow people with mild cognitive impairment over time, about half of them do decline and develop either Alzheimer's disease or another form of dementia. But that also means the other half don't. The other half, their memory actually stays stable or their memory actually improves over time. You might say to yourself, how does anybody's memory actually improve over time? Well, if their memory problems were due to depression, low mood, as their mood gets better, their memory can get better. Another common cause of memory problems are medication side effects. And if the individual works with their doctor and changes their medication, their memory can improve. Okay. So that's a little bit about step three. Now we're going to move to step four, treat your memory loss. But before I can tell you about the treatments for uh, memory loss, I need to tell you a little bit more about what causes it, a little bit more about how Alzheimer's develops. So we believe that Alzheimer's disease starts with an accumulation of an abnormal protein called beta amyloid. The amyloid clusters and clumps together to form plaques. Now, when I use the word plaque, some of you may immediately wonder, 
are those amyloid plaques similar to the cholesterol plaques that build up on the arteries like in the neck? Or are they similar to the plaques that my dentist is worried about on my teeth? And the answer is no, okay? Plaque is just a general term for schmutz. So anything in the body that accumulates that shouldn't be there, uh, we often call a plaque. Now the plaques get bigger and bigger until they start to damage neighboring brain cells. And inside the cells, another protein called tau gets loose and the tau is very sticky and it sticks to itself and it forms these long chains and the chains get all tangled up and form tangles. Now, once the tangles form inside the cells, it kills the cell. And the cells are normally making chemicals, neurotransmitters that allow different parts of the brain to talk to one another. And one of the most important of these chemicals is called acetylcholine. So in Alzheimer's disease, the levels of acetylcholine drop. It's for this reason that in Alzheimer's disease, uh, one of the mainstays of therapy are medications that can actually raise up the levels of acetylcholine. Now, these are medications that many of you may have heard of. Some of you may be taking these medications. These are medications like denepazil, whose brand name is Aricept, Rivastigmine, whose brand name is Exelon, or Galantamine. All of these medications help to raise up the levels of acetylcholine in the brain. Now, from the perspective of the individual and their family, what these medications can do is they can actually turn the clock back on memory loss by six to 12 months. So what I mean by that is when someone comes in to see me, I can make their memory like it was six months ago or maybe even a full year ago. And guess what? The earlier that they come in to see me, the more likely it is that I can turn the clock back on their memory problems a full 12 months. And there's a very simple reason why. There are more brain cells that are still living that the medication can work on. Okay, now I've talked about being able to turn the clock back by six to 12 months. But unfortunately, I cannot stop the clock from ticking down. So let's say two or three years later, yes, indeed, the person is likely to be worse than when I first saw them. But that does not mean the medication is not still working because they're still six to 12 months better off than they otherwise would be. And if they stop the medicine two or three years later, what happens is they'll plummet six to 12 months worth of memory function in one to two weeks. So because of that, as long as someone has had a good response to these medications, we pretty much want them to stay on it uh, forever. Now, I talked about turning that clock back. Well, wouldn't it be great if you could actually slow the clock down? And that's what some of the new medicines that are being developed in clinical trials are trying to do. So these are medications that try to remove the plaques or the tangles or use other new innovative approach, uh, approaches to try to actually slow down the accumulation of amyloid or remove the tau before it causes problems or using other ways to protect the brain. And if anyone is interested in some of these clinical trials, uh, these are available at many places throughout the city, including at the Boston University Alzheimer's Disease Center, and also at a clinic that I work in called the Boston Center for Memory in Newton, Massachusetts, by the uh, Newton-Needham border off of 128. So if someone's interested in those, you can ask questions in the chat or uh, we can email you information about that. Okay, now we're gonna move on to step five, which is modify your lifestyle. And we are going to catch up with Jack. 
So Jack's daughter, Sarah, has invited her father over to dinner so that Sarah can show Jack what having a healthy meal is like. So what meat are we having? Asked Jack. We're having fish, Sarah says, as she dips a brush in olive oil and bastes a large piece of fish. Also on the roasting pan are several garlic cloves and two large onions. Waiting for the fish on the serving platter are some avocado slices and lemon wedges. What? No meat? Not even chicken? No, fish, beans, and brown rice. I want you to see how delicious a healthy meal can be. Jack inhales the aroma of the roasting fish. Mmm, that actually smells pretty good. Where did you learn to cook like this? I took a class on Italian cooking. These foods are all part of the Mediterranean diet. It's one of the very few diets that has been proven to be good for your brain. And of course, Sarah is exactly right. The Mediterranean diet and a few others that we'll talk about in a minute are the only diets that study after study after study has shown are good for brain health. So the Mediterranean diet includes fish, olive oil, avocados, fruits and vegetables, nuts and beans, and whole grains. A similar diet called the MIND diet also includes chicken <clears throat> two times a week. So in a nutshell, these are the things that are good to eat. So you may be wondering, well, what are the things that are not good to eat? Well, I hate to tell you, it's almost everything else. So red meats, fried foods, fatty foods, butter and margarine, pastries and most sweets, white bread, white flour, white rice, sugar sodas and diet sodas, all of those I put in the category of once in a while food, not every single day food. All right, but before everyone gets really depressed and thinks, oh my God, I can never have dessert again. I did want to remind you that chocolate in small amounts has been shown to benefit thinking and memory and mood. You just have to remember that it's what type of chocolate? That's right, dark chocolate, the darker the better because it's the actual cacao that is what's good for you not so much the sugar and the butter and the milk to make it sweet and creamy. All right, now we're gonna talk about exercise. And I don't need a show of hands to know that everyone on this Zoom call knows that exercise is good for you. But I bet you that I can tell you at least one new thing that you did not know before you joined this call this evening about just how good exercise is for you and why. But if I inspire you tonight and you say to yourself, I'm gonna run to my doctor tomorrow, I do want you to check with your doctor and just make sure that your heart and your lungs and your bones and your joints are ready for whatever increased exercise you're going to do. But having said that, there's exercise that everybody can do. In fact, most of the studies that were done that I'm gonna be talking about were done with brisk walking. So that alone is a wonderful exercise. You can do jogging, you can do biking, you can do swimming, you can do aerobic classes, bar classes, you can move in the pool. And even if you cannot walk, there are only exercises which can be very uh, vigorous. If you're not sure the right type of exercise to do, please ask your doctor. Okay, so how much exercise do you need to do? Well, the studies suggest that you should do at least, note that I'm saying at least 30 minutes a day, five days a week of aerobic exercise. So what's aerobic? Well, aerobic is exercise that gets your heart beating fast, gets your breathing heavy. That's how you know it's aerobic. It's also recommended to spend two hours each week on exercise that helps with strength 
and balance and flexibility. These are things like yoga, Tai Chi, Pilates, and isometric uh, weight training. All of those help with strength and balance and flexibility. So let's talk about some of the benefits of exercise. So the first you know already, right? It reduces heart disease and strokes, but it's worth saying because strokes can damage your memory. It also reduces your risk of falls. And of course, if you fall and hit your head, you can damage your memory. It reduces depression. And we talked about how depression is another cause of memory problems. And in fact, did you know that exercise is as powerful an antidepressant as many antidepressants currently on the market today. Now exercise also improves sleep. And you might say, well, that's good, but what does sleep have to do with memory? Turns out sleep has a lot to do with memory. And I'll tell you three of the reasons. The first is what I think of as the most obvious one, which is if you don't get good sleep the night before, you're gonna be tired the next day and if you're tired, you're not gonna be able to pay attention. And if you don't pay attention, you cannot learn. You have to pay attention in order to remember things. The second reason is that we all make a little bit of this amyloid protein during the day while we are awake. But at night, we clear it away while we are sleeping. So we need to get good sleep for that. The third reason, is that sleep helps us to keep our memories for a lifetime. So we talked before about the hippocampus, which is where all the new memories are formed and where they are stored. But it turns out there's a whole nother cabinet in the brain where all the older memories are stored. And this process where the memories are being transferred from the new memory file cabinet to the older memory file cabinet takes place while we are sleeping. So we need to get good sleep to hold on to those memories for a lifetime. But the most exciting thing that I wanna tell you about exercise is that exercise actually helps us to release growth factors in the brain, which helps us to grow new brain cells. And this increase in brain cells is so large that even in older adults, as you can see here, age 55 to 80, you can actually see the expansion of the hippocampus of our memory file cabinet on an MRI scan in as little time as six months. And the exercise is directly correlated with growth factors, with the size of the hippocampus and performance in memory in day-to-day -day life. So people sometimes ask me, Dr. Budson, isn't there some magic bullet out there that I can take to improve my memory? I say, yes, there is. It is exercise. Exercise truly is the magic bullet. All right, so now we are going to talk about step six, which is strengthen your memory. And we are going to again, catch up with Jack. Now, Jack and his daughter, Sarah, have gotten into a little argument. Sarah has purchased a subscription to an online computerized brain training program. And she would like Jack to spend at least 30 minutes each day working on it. Can you just try it, Dad? I don't like those things, Sarah. I'm no good at computers. I know you're a whiz at this computer stuff, but I'm not. Computers make me feel old and stupid. I'm not asking you to become an expert. I just want you to try it. The website says it can make you smarter and make your brain younger. Sarah, I know you're trying to help me, but I wanna to go to my pottery class so I can finish my project. And then I'm meeting the guys to play hockey. I don't have time for this computer stuff. Can't you miss your hockey game for one week? And your hockey game seems more like a social event anyways. You spend one hour playing and two hours chatting over dinner. 
So what's wrong with that? We like to have dinner after playing and I'm working on eating better, just like you showed me. Can't you just try the computer, Dad? All right. For you, Sarah, I'll give it a try. But I'm still going to go to my pottery class and then go play hockey with the guys. Making sure he is on the right page of the website, Sarah leaves her father to the computer training. Jack looks at the clock. Okay, he thinks to himself, I can spend 10 minutes on this computer stuff and still have time to get ready for hockey and then uh, go to my pottery class. Well, Jack says as he finishes the first set of exercises on the computer, it wasn't as bad as I thought, although I don't feel any smarter. <clears throat> so what the studies show is if you spend time on crossword puzzles or Sudoku or computer games, you get better at crossword puzzles and Sudoku and computer games. It simply does not translate to overall brain function. But there are some things that do. And guess what? Jack was doing all of them. So the first couple we've already talked about. He's playing hockey, which is aerobic exercise. He's trying to eat better using the Mediterranean diet. But he's also doing social activities. He's playing hockey with his friends, having dinner with his friends, and he's even meeting new friends in his pottery class. And study after study after study has shown that doing social activities are important. And in this day and age of COVID, doing Zoom calls and socializing like that is important. Phone calls with friends are important. You know, FaceTime video cameras are important. Walking with a friend, wearing masks six feet apart, all of those things are important. Now, another thing that Jack is doing is he's doing something new with his brain, something different, something that challenges himself, which for him is the pottery class, okay? And the studies show if you're going to do something with your brain, it needs to be novel, needs to be different. Now, for you, perhaps you've always wanted to learn a language and now is the time that you can work on doing it. Or perhaps you want to do a new craft or a new hobby, that would count too. Perhaps because you can't visit the city or the country that you'd like to do because of COVID, you're going to learn about it by checking out books from the library or watching films on it, learning new information like that, that counts too. Now suppose you play a musical instrument and you say, well, what about that? Does that count? Well, it counts as long as in addition to playing the same tunes you've played for 30, 40 years, you learn new tunes. Or if you really want to stress, uh, strengthen your memory the most, learn a whole new genre of music that will really stretch yourself in a new uh, direction. And the last thing that Jack is doing that again, study after study has shown is important is he is doing things that give him a positive uh, feeling about uh, aging and life in general. And I know it sounds like pop psychology, but thinking positive has been shown to help. And we think it helps for all the uh, obvious reasons. Having a positive attitude will make you more likely to be social and outgoing and spend time with friends and families. Having a positive attitude is more likely to make you take care of yourself and eat right and exercise. Now, some of the other things that are uh, beneficial uh, to try to strengthen your memory uh, from a practical standpoint are to, um, talked about these, are to <clears throat> do different types of strategies, okay? And there are strategies for all types of different activities. So you can work to improve your ability to pay attention by doing mindfulness training. Mindfulness training is a type of medication 
where you work on concentrating on your breathing or parts of your body or anything you want, but you don't let your mind wander. Okay, so that's one thing you can do. There's all different types of strategies that you can do. If you want to remember where you parked your car, we have strategies for that. If you want to remember people's names, we have strategies uh, for that. If you want to uh, remember your grocery list or your holiday list, we have strategies for all sorts of different things. And you can find the details in the book and certainly in the question and answer period. I'm happy to talk about some of those if you would like. We also list all sorts of different memory aids that can be helpful. So a memory aid is any sort of physical object, whether it's a pillbox, a calendar or a planner, a to-do list, using your uh, smartphone to help you uh, remember things. Memory aids can help almost anyone. I did want to give you our three golden rules when you're using memory aids. So the first thing is when you're using them, don't delay. So if someone gives you a date and time of an appointment, don't delay, write it down right away. Staying with the theme of calendars, if I inspire you today and you say to yourself, I'm going to really get organized. I'm not going to miss another appointment. I'm going to remember all of those types of things. I'm going to get a calendar for my pocketbook and one for my desk and one for the refrigerator and one for my work. Don't do that. Don't get four calendars. It'll be very confusing. You'll have some appointments on one calendar and on another one. You'll be copying things from one to the other and you may misplace it or you may copy down the wrong thing in the wrong place. It'll be a disaster. So just get one calendar and bring it with you everywhere. And of course, if it's a paper calendar, there's no harm in snapping some pictures of it with your smartphone a week or two in advance in case you lose it. Second golden rule, or the, excuse me, the third golden rule is make it routine. So if you use these different memory aids every single time, then instead of it being something new, something challenging, something that's like a, a chore or a task, it will become routine and automatic. You won't even need to think about it and you will do it. Now, the last step is step seven, which is plan your future. And in this step, we talk about what are the changes in life that you need to make if you're having some memory problems. We talk about, you know, if you're working, how do you keep working? What are the right jobs to do? And also, when do you know that it's time to retire? If you're doing hobbies, we're talking about what are good hobbies, what are safe hobbies that you can continue to do even when you're having memory problems. We also talk about practical things like uh, financial decisions, driving, you know, is it safe to drive? How long is it safe to drive? And when do you need to know? You got to hang up the keys and let someone else do the driving. So those are the seven steps to managing your memory. And now I would be very pleased to answer any questions. And I am going to begin by peeking at the chat. And there's one question here that says, what do you do if you're having difficulty in remembering names. So we have a lot of different strategies that you can use for remembering names. So the person who wrote this question, which actually you, you can see in, in the chat if you peek, um, says she used to go through the alphabet, but that doesn't seem to work anymore. Well, what the studies show actually helps the most is if instead of trying to think of the person's name, Try to think about other things you know about the person. Think about where do you know them from? Is it from your, your group at the library or from your religious organization? 
or from you know, friends of your children, how do you know them? Okay, that will help to trigger the right thing or think about their children, think about other things you know about them. That will start to connect you to the right name. And the other thing that's helpful is don't think of the wrong name. Or if you do think of the wrong name, don't ruminate on it, don't keep saying it. Because it turns out that the wrong name blocks the right name, okay? That's one of the reasons that you think of the name later is because you've stopped blocking it by saying the wrong name. So don't say the wrong name. Okay, so uh, let's see a few other questions. Is it normal to forget nouns of familiar objects? The answer is it's not. It is normal to have trouble coming up with the name of a person or a restaurant or a movie title. It is not normal to have trouble coming up with, you know, desk, table, chair, uh, uh, cup, water, something like that. That's not normal. You should definitely see your doctor about that. And if your doctor doesn't do something about it, you say, hey, I just heard this talk about your memory. And Dr. Budson said, it's not normal to remember those, to forget those things. And I want an evaluation for me or for my husband or my spouse, whoever it is. Okay, um, what sort of a specialist should one see to evaluate their memory? Well, it depends a little bit on who is the best type of specialist in your community. The best person to go to is someone who is a memory specialist. So that's either a neurologist like myself or it is a psychiatrist who's done advanced training in cognitive problems or a geriatrician. Those are the three specialists that it might be, but a general neurologist, a general psychiatrist <clears throat> may not be the right person. So you wanna try and go <clears throat> to a memory clinic. That would be the right way to go. Now, if anyone wants to come see me, uh, if you're a veteran, I am very happy to see you at the Jamaica Plain campus or by Zoom these days or by phone at um, uh, the, the VA Boston healthcare system. If you're not a veteran, as I mentioned, I could see you at the Boston Center uh, for Memory and that's one of the places we do the clinical trials if someone's interested in some of the new um, things. Okay, uh, I've always been a good speller but lately I've noticed my spelling has gone downhill. Could stress from COVID be affecting my spelling? Do I need to use a spell checker or call my doctor? Well, I will tell you, if the only problem you're having is spelling and everything else is totally fine, uh, I probably wouldn't worry about it and I would just use a spell checker. Now, if you're not sure if everything else is right or not, a good thing to do is to ask a family member or a close friend, hey, I've noticed some trouble with spelling. I think everything else is working fine. Have you noticed that I'm having any problems with thinking or memory? And see what they say. If they say, you're fine, then you're probably fine. Uh, but if they're worried, if they say, you know, I didn't want to mention it, but now that you asked, I have actually noticed you're repeating yourself a lot. That would be a time to go see the doctor because then it's more than just spelling errors. Okay. Um, how is memory tested so that a change or abnormal memory would be apparent? So when someone is evaluated for their memory, uh, we always begin by getting a history. And we take that history not only from the individual themselves, but we always wanna speak with a close friend or a family member. And it's for a couple of reasons, but one of the uh, most basic is also the most obvious, which is if you're having trouble remembering things, you might forget some of the times you can't remember, right? So, so we always wanna speak with a family member as well. Uh, then we do pencil and paper testing, okay? We do actually some testing depending upon the clinic. We do some testing over the phone Okay, we ask you to remember things. We ask you the day, the date. We ask you to do other types of tasks uh, over the phone or in person doing pencil and paper testing. And then we also do a physical and neurological exam, tap on your reflexes, listen to your heart and your lungs, that sort of thing. We do some blood work. 
uh, look for vitamin deficiencies, thyroid disorders, things like that. We also do a brain scan. We do an MRI scan or a CAT scan of your brain and make sure everything looks good there. So those are the basic elements of an evaluation uh, that we do. And if you go to your doctor and your doctor says, oh, you're having memory problems? No, no worries. I'll do some blood work and we'll sort it out. Say, wait a minute, what about the pencil and paper testing? What about the history? What about the exam? You know, what about, you know, the MRI scan? You know, it really needs to have all these different elements uh, uh, in it. We have a whole chapter on like what your doctor should do uh, for that evaluation. Okay. Uh, is there something like an MRI to see the plaques in the brain? Turns out there's a special scan that is a special type of a PET scan or a positron emission tomography, but nobody says that. Everyone just says a PET scan that will actually show the plaques in the brain. And so these are actually FDA approved. In fact, they've been FDA approved for eight years, okay? And uh, the problem is that Medicare doesn't pay for them. Other insurance companies don't pay for them. In fact, one of the few places you can get them for more or less for free is at the VA. You come to my clinic, if you need one of these scans, we'll get one for you. Not everybody needs it, but if you need one, uh, we will get it. So these scans are available. The other way you can get these scans if you're not a veteran is through clinical trials. Most of the clinical trials require you to have a positive PET scan that shows these plaques before you participate. So you can get a free scan from the trial as well. Next question is, does Alzheimer's tend to be hereditary? And the answer is, Half of the people with Alzheimer's do have a family history and the other half don't. So everyone is at risk for Alzheimer's whether you have a family history or you don't. But if you do have a family history, it does increase your chances of getting the disease by two to fourfold. So to put some numbers on that, the risk of getting Alzheimer's disease at age 65 is approximately 3% without a family history. So with a family history, that's double to quadruple. So it's 6% to 12%. So on the one hand, that's a big increase in risk. But on the other hand, that also means you have an 88% chance of being uh, normal, of not having it, right? So uh, there, is, uh, there is a hereditary component. Do you have a recommended approach of introducing this topic to a loved one who appears to be having these issues but ignores them or laughs them off? So there are a couple of things. So the holidays are coming up, right? So makes a great holiday gift right there. Get a copy of the book, give it to them in a wrapper. No, but it, in all seriousness, um, I actually recommend you know using this talk uh, that you're hearing right now as a way. You know, you could say you know, I thought your memory was fine. It was just because you're getting a little older. But now that I heard this talk from Dr. Budson, I'm actually worried that your memory may not be normal for your age. And more importantly, I learned that there are lots of different things that causes memory problems. It's not just Alzheimer's. It could be a vitamin deficiency. It could be a thyroid disorder. It could be a medication side effect. And those things are all essentially curable. And even if it's Alzheimer's, I learned there's medications that can actually help. So, you know, that might be an approach uh, that could work. So I, I think between, you know, if they're a reader, you honestly could get the book out of the library and share the book with them. If they're not, you know, you could use the fact that you went to this talk as a reason and remind them that just because they're having memory problems doesn't mean it's Alzheimer's. And even if it is, there's a lot of things you can do. And don't forget what I said, the earlier that one starts the treatment, the better the treatment works because there's more brain cells still living that the treatment can work on. Okay, I hope that is helpful. 
Uh, what about some online exercises for the mind, preferably free? So let me say this again. I do not recommend online exercises. I don't, I don't recommend it. There's no evidence that it will do anything that make you get better at online exercises, okay? So I want you to do something social. I want you to call up a friend. I want you to do other things. I want you to take up a hobby. I want you to learn a musical instrument. Or if you play a musical instrument, I want you to learn new tunes. I want you to do things that stretch yourself in some way, shape, or form. I, you know, you if you enjoy playing computer games, fine, knock yourself out, play computer games. If after a long day where you're socializing, you're exercising, you're eating right, you like nothing better than to curl up in a your favorite armchair and do a crossword puzzle, that's awesome. Do it but don't do it because you think it's gonna improve your brain. Do it because you enjoy it. So I don't recommend online exercises. If you say something about alcohol, okay. So there are many studies to show that one alcoholic beverage a day is, and that means of course, one beer, five to six ounces of wine, or one to one and a half ounces of hard liquor, not more than that, uh, one alcoholic beverage a day is probably either not harmful or some people think it could be helpful. Uh, I think the data is not quite clear. So here's my simple recommendation. If you already enjoy having one alcoholic beverage a day and you would like to continue that's fine, I have no problem with that. If uh, you're having more than that, I recommend you cut down to one a day. If you don't drink alcohol or you drink less than that, that's great. Just don't drink if you don't drink. And if you drink once a week, you have one glass of wine on Friday night, fine. Then you have one glass of wine on Friday night. So I recommend you either cut down to one a day or you stay at whatever level you're at if that's what you uh, enjoy. It's really just not out. Are there any vaccines being tried now? So uh, is that mean for Alzheimer's? Uh, there are some, um, they're, uh, they're sort of like vaccines. They're called monoclonal antibodies. So they're antibodies made in a laboratory against Alzheimer's. And they're trying a lot of them. Uh, none of them have been proven to work. I've got my fingers crossed that one of these will work soon and that's going on in clinical trials. So that's worth uh, looking at. And there any connection between coronavirus and cognitive problems? Uh, yes, I've written a blog on that on Harvard uh, Health. And um, uh, Christine can probably Google uh, Harvard Health blog, Andrew Budson and find it and she'll put it in the chat uh, for you. Um, are there sex differences in the diagnosis and response treatment for Alzheimer's disease. Yes, that's actually interesting. So in terms of the, what there's a difference is of the prevalence, which is how common it is. It turns out that of everybody that has Alzheimer's, about two thirds of them are women. So it's more common to have Alzheimer's disease if you're a woman, a woman than if you're a man. And it's not simply because uh, women live longer. There seems to be some other reason. And I've got some, some theories and, you know, if, if, if we were gonna, you know, spend a long time talking and you got me late into the night, I might tell you some interesting theories that I, that I have, but nothing's really proven as to why people are trying to uh, understand that. Aside from your uh, suggestions, uh, do you recommend other steps for someone in a family diagnosed with Alzheimer's? I see. So the idea is what is the best thing to do if you're a family member and one of your parents or one of your siblings uh, has Alzheimer's, what can you do? Well, it turns out that the things that I recommended, including exercise, diet, staying social, doing new things and having a positive attitude, those are the things that have been proven to slow down the disease process if you're destined to get it and there's nothing you can do to stop it or to hopefully prevent it altogether. So I'll tell you one study that was done 
looked at people who did have a family history of Alzheimer's disease, but who began exercising vigorously in their middle ages, usually around 40 or 50. And what they showed is the ones who exercise vigorously were able to delay the onset of Alzheimer's disease by 11 years from age 79 to 90. Okay, so it's a big, it's a big deal. You can make a big difference in your life by doing these things. There really is nothing else that has been proven. Some people say, oh, you have to use turmeric, you know, curcumin, you got to use that. Well, you know, I don't think there's good evidence for it, but you know, I like Indian food. This is basically the fundamental ingredient in curry. If you like curry and you want to do it, go for it. Uh, there's not strong evidence for it, but it's not going to hurt you. What about that Prevagen stuff that they advertise on TV all the time? Will that help? No, that will not help anyone. That is, there's another name for that. That's called snake oil. That's the other name for Prevagen, okay? Snake oil. So if you have some Prevagen, you can, as soon as you get off the Zoom call, you go to your medicine cabinet, you take it, you turn it upside down, in the trash, okay? That's what you should do with that. And I'm sorry if it cost you an arm and a leg. Don't be like, well, I spent so much money on it, I'm gonna keep taking it, you know? Like, don't do that, it doesn't work. And there are people that have been harmed by it. So take it, throw it out. All right, uh-oh, we're running out of chat questions. Christine, I think you gotta open it up, let everybody shout out. Well, one more just came into chat, oh, did, um, did but I can. How, if how about medicinal or recreation, recreational marijuana? Does it have a negative effect on memory? Well, I will tell you, the studies are actually very unclear as to this point. Uh, but I, I think that marijuana's effects on memory that I can tell fit the stereotypes. So the stereotype is that marijuana can make people a little bit more laid back, a little bit less sort of uptight. And in general, that's not a really good thing for the memory. So like caffeine, having a cup of coffee in the morning, that is actually a stimulant as people know, right? That actually helps you remember better. So for most people, marijuana that makes you calmer, makes you more mellow, most people, it makes your memory worse. But for people who are like too anxious, if they're using it as an anti-anxiety medication, it might make them uh, remember things a little bit better. Very hard to know. It is, does seem a little idiosyncratic. I'm not against people trying it, but um, I'm not really impressed with its effects. We used to worry about aluminum, right? We were like, throw out your Teflon pans, the aluminum's gonna kill you. Uh, we don't think aluminum is important. I use Teflon pans, I think they're fine. Um, does having ADHD or other cognitive issues make you more likely to get Alzheimer's? Short answer is no, it does not. But obviously, if you have memory problems from Alzheimer's and you have attention problems from attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, it's not going to help your ability to think and remember things, right? You got two problems instead of just one. Uh, but it doesn't make you more likely to get Alzheimer's just because you have ADHD. Okay, another worry, mercury in fillings or tuna, another uh, worry to, okay. So mercury and fillings do not worry about, okay? Anyone that says, oh, you need to take chelation therapy or pull your fillings out, they don't know what they're talking about. Don't worry about that, okay? Mercury in fish is something to be concerned about. Uh, the, um, uh, the FDA has on their website some uh, of the fish that are safe to eat and the fish to uh, either stay away from or just have the more like once a month instead of like once a week uh, because it could have some high levels of mercury. The thing in general is that fish like cod has very low levels of mercury. And some of the big uh, cake, uh, steak fishes like tuna uh, and swordfish, they tend to have more mercury, but it's a little complex. And I recommend looking at the FDA's website on that. The other thing that's always safe are farm raised fish. 
because uh, obviously if it's a reputable farm, they're not gonna put mercury in it. The mercury is like pollutants, right? In, in the, the wild lakes and streams and oceans. But uh, farm raised salmon, for example, is not gonna have mercury and you don't need to worry about that. Um, okay, uh, what's the best way to find clinical trials if you don't have relevant departments in the hospitals? So uh, again, the two that I work with uh, is the Boston University Alzheimer's Disease Center if you wanna go to downtown Boston. And if you wanna to go to the suburbs, we're doing it in our clinic called the, uh, the Boston Center for Memory, which even though it's called the Boston Center for Memory, it's in Newton uh, on the newton Needham border just off 128. So not very far from uh, Lexington. And um, it's uh, www.bostonmemory.com. Uh, so that's easy and you can Google it too. Uh, is meditation helpful? Meditation is helpful if you want to focus your mind to be able to pay attention to just what you want to pay attention to because you'll be more likely to remember that thing. So the answer is yes, if you're working on paying attention better. Uh, then meditation is helpful. So we talked about attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So mindfulness would be particularly helpful for someone who is that trouble. Does humor help? Of course, humor helps. Humor is helpful when you're having social interactions. Humor is helpful staying positive and having a positive uh, attitude. And good God, in this pandemic, you got to have some humor, right? Or we're all going to be in, in trouble. I don't actually know any studies that talk about, actually, you know, there might be one study about humor, but humor is definitely a good thing. Do people with, uh, why do people with Down syndrome get Alzheimer's? Uh, that's unfortunately very easy to answer. We talked about these, this amyloid protein that clusters and clumps together and forms plaques. Well, the amyloid protein is coded for a gene by a gene, just like every protein in the body comes from a gene. So the genes are on one of our, <clears throat> of our, uh, <clears throat> our chromosomes. And it happens that these, this amyloid protein is coded for chromosome 21, all right? And 21, is the chromosome that one has an extra copy on in Down syndrome. So it's simply because people with Down syndrome make more of this protein because they have an extra copy of chromosome 21. They have more amyloid, which forms more plaques, which causes Alzheimer's disease at a younger age. So that's why everyone with Down syndrome gets Alzheimer's usually in, by the time they're in their 50s or 60s at the latest. Does an antidepressant make you more prone to dementia? That's a good question. I'm gonna say that the majority of antidepressants do not, okay? So all of the Prozac-like medicines, the so-called SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, do not. Things like bupropion do not. Okay, there are some old school antidepressants that are probably not so good for you. But as long as you're being cared for by a psychiatrist, I, I think you're probably doing the right thing. Um, okay, someone wants a text of the talk, I'm gonna let Christine uh, work about that. Does caffeine have any effect on memory, also green tea? So yes, as I mentioned, uh, uh, caffeine is a stimulant. A stimulant helps to wake you up, makes you pay attention as long as you use it you know, early in the day. So it's not going to keep you up at night and interfere with your sleep. We talked about how important sleep was, green tea, the same thing. Coffee may have other things in it that's good for you. Almost all the studies show coffee is beneficial. I think with green tea as well, just don't overdo it, right? Too much caffeine makes you jittery. You can lose focus. So moderation is important. Uh, does weightlifting exercise the same positive effect as aerobic exercises? No, not at all, uh, not at all. So it needs to be aerobic. Now, if you wanna do weightlifting too, that's awesome, right? So you wanna do um, aerobic exercise at least 30 minutes a day, five days a week, okay? Then you want to add to it two hours a week 
of things that help with strength, balance, and flexibility, including weightlifting as one of those things. But you still have to do the aerobic, cannot skip the aerobic. Okay, do medications like Benadryl impact memory? Absolutely. There is, sorry, there's only one good sleeping pill, which is melatonin. If you tell me, doesn't work for me, well, you know, that's fine. Then there probably are other things wrong with your sleep that can't be fixed by adjusting your circadian rhythm. That's what melatonin is good for. But Benadryl, uh, Ativan, um, Valium, um, the, uh, uh, the, other, uh, the other common uh, sleeping uh, uh, medications, uh, none of these things are, are, are good for you. Uh, Zolpidem, it, it's not, not good for you. So I do not recommend that you take any of those uh, sleeping pills. Really, like I said, the only one that I, that I recommend is melatonin. I will tell you the, yeah, trazodone, not good. Trazodone, uh, not good. Uh, melatonin uh, uh, doesn't ha really have a positive or negative effect on your thinking and memory. It, it's, it's a hormone your body makes uh, normally. Uh, do naps count as sleeping? Naps absolutely count as sleeping. So there's no problem uh, there. Uh, trazodone is not an SSRI. Trazodone is a more complicated uh, uh, substance. Um, it, it, you can argue all you want. Trazodone is not good for you. I, I'm sorry. Now, if, if you are working with a psychiatrist and you need to take trazodone for whatever reason, fine. You know, I mean, these medications are out there for a reason. Uh, I'm not saying they're bad medicines. I'm just saying, are they good for your memory? No, the answer is they're not, they're not good for your memory. Now, I will tell you, I want to tell you, since people seem to be interested in sleep, the number one reason that, um, that people have trouble falling asleep is that they're trying to sleep too many hours. I'm not saying that's true with all of you out there, but that's the number one reason. So people come to my clinic and they say, I take this sleeping pill because I can't go to sleep at night without it. I say, oh, well, what time do you go to bed? They say, oh, you know, around 10 o'clock, I get into bed, try and go to sleep. And what time do you want to get up in the morning? Oh, around eight o'clock. Sounds perfectly reasonable, right? But add up the hours. They're trying to sleep 10 hours a day. No one can sleep, well, almost no one can sleep 10 hours a day. If you can, fine, more power to you. But that's not the average amount of sleep. The average amount of sleep for the average adult is eight hours a day. And as one gets older, that actually shrinks by 30 minutes at about seven and a half hours. So the most common reason is people are trying to sleep too many hours. So if they simply go to bed at 11 and try and wake up at seven, all of a sudden they find they can uh, go to sleep. Okay, um, I have blurry vision after taking three uh, milligrams of melatonin from Trader Joe's. Uh, what about another brand? Well, you, you, could, you could try another, another brand. That would be, that would be fine. The, the reason that you may have blurry vision is so guess what? When people are tired, they have blurry vision. And so it's possible that if you took it uh, at the wrong time, it could make you feel tired uh, the next day. Uh, does a siesta help or naps? You know, those things are just fine. I have no problem with that, but you have to add it to your total hours of sleep. So if you sleep an hour a day as a nap, which is fine, anywhere an hour or less as a nap is fine, then you're only allowed to sleep seven hours at night, okay? Or from whatever is your, your, your magic number, uh, there is obviously some variability from one person to another, but you have to add it to your total sleep. Okay, so the history of poor sleep correlate with the probability of Alzheimer's. Luckily, it doesn't, okay? It, it does not. Uh, uh, there's no uh, real evidence that shift workers, for example, you know, get more Alzheimer's than uh, people who aren't shift workers, so that's okay. Okay, it's 826. Are there anyone wants to ask a question that's not in the chat? I do think, Christine, we should unmute people for 
for at least a minute or two, because there might be people who just don't feel comfortable with the chat that still want to ask a question. Well, let me, before we unmute people, just to protect everyone's privacy, let me go ahead and stop the recording. Okay. And that may make people feel more comfortable if they want to share. Okay. And Andrew, I'm also cognizant of the time. So whenever yeah. you need to break for your dinner, um, yeah. we will respect that. But let me just stop.